I am now recording. Today is April 12th, I believe, 2019, and this is the regularly scheduled uh, class meeting of ITSE 2309 at Collin College. Um, topic for today comes from uh, module, what is it, module? Um, module on database design anyway, I believe it, what module is that? Uh, module 12, database design. So this is selected topics, database design, module 12. Um, and the last three modules can come really in any order. Uh, they don't, one of them doesn't depend on the other. They're, they're all, more advanced topics for this class, so it's kind of wrapping up. We've covered most everything. I might go back and cover some things from uh, SQL that we kind of skipped over, um, but for the most part, we're done with SQL. And right now, I'm going to talk some things about database normalization speaks to database design, designing tables. How do you design a table from scratch? Well, you know, most of the time you don't design a table from scratch. You design a table to fit a working, something that they're doing and they have some paper uh, forms that they're using or they're using a spreadsheet or they're, they're putting it into some kind of a, 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 a format all of their data and your job is figuring out how to streamline it and make it better. So the six basic steps for designing a data structure are pretty straightforward. Identify the elements, subdivide each element into its smallest useful component, identify the tables, identify primary and foreign keys, and then is it normalized? In other words, database is normalizing means, and we'll talk about what that means, uh, but we say that data are normalized when we have eliminated some errors. And I don't ever want to have any data redundancy. Don't make me say that again. Redundancy means the data are in some place and they're someplace else. So data redundancy would be if you update your address with the registrar's office, then you have to update your address with the library and you have to update your address with financial aid. Um, I can remember that. And you would have, everybody would have the, you know, an old address. Um, ideally, in one system, you want to update your address in one place. So your data, your, your address should just be in one table. When you update that, it updates all of them. Everything uses foreign keys. Um, Okay, and finally, identify the indexes, and we're going to talk about indexing. That's going to be um, a big deal. And um, the creating an index is, is pretty easy, but if you are searching a field regularly, for some reason, this field is hot. This field I'm searching. A primary key is hot. A foreign key is hot. And something like a person's name is probably hot. And let's maybe, use it, maybe, I don't know, maybe you just don't search on that. But an index speeds up searching at a cost of a lot of disk space. Okay, identify the data elements. You know what this word is right here? Have you seen this word? Heuristic. What does that word mean? Fee, have you seen that word before? I believe it comes from the French. Um, a heuristic. Heuristic is a way, well, okay, there's two ways of thinking. One of them is an algorithm. Algorithm says, you do this, you always get the right answer. A heuristic is a process of working to the right answer, and it usually gives you the best answer, but not always. Uh, it, it's um, kind of subjective. 
And sometimes there's more than one way to arrive at a good table. And sometimes they don't all look exactly alike and they can be two equally good structures and they can be slightly different. But using a heuristic, I will get close to it, okay? Um, so using these steps, identifying the data elements, um, we usually begin to um, designing a database to model an existing process. Most of the time we don't start from scratch. Is that music on my headset or? Okay, that's fine. Um, uh, it's either done by hand, spreadsheet, some system. And go look at the documents that are in use now. Okay. Here is one that might be used in our accounts payable table. This one might have been used. Actually, this one came from the, I'm not sure whether it was the textbook or the, the slides. Um, and so this one shows the name of the, let's see, this is the vendor. So the vendor would be Acme Fabrication. Um, and it's got the address, telephone number, invoice number. Now the invoice number, uh, it's important to note, is, is given to us by the, um, by the vendor. They come up with the invoice number, invoice date. I don't, I don't assign the invoice number. And let's see, in this, the terms, the part number, the quantities, the descriptions, the unit price, I have my vendor contact number, and the invoice total. Most everything is is there, so I've got I've got two two uh, tables here on this one piece of paper. Information from two tables. I've got information about the vendor, and I've got information about the invoice, and I need to split it out. So start looking at these data elements. I've got a vendor name, vendor address, phone number, fax number, web address, invoice number, invoice, invoice, invoice. Um, item, actually there's three things. There's line items on here too. Item description, item extension. In other words, the, the item extension is, I buy 12 at $100 a piece. The extension is $1,200. In other words, that's the line item total. Um, Vendor accounts receivable, contact name, and finally invoice total. Okay, I the first thing I start doing, I'm looking for elements that can be derived from other existing data. I don't want to put something into a table if I can calculate it. And there's a couple of things right there that jump immediately to my mind. You see them. Extensions calculated right there. I mean, it just it's a simply quantity times the unit price, sometimes called net price. Um, <clears throat> uh, the tax is probably um, let let's see. It could be based on the state. If I were taking possession of it in a different state or something, I would pay sales tax in different states. Um, so I might, I might be looking up a, a sales tax there, or it might just be a flat rate. <laughs> I see our um, legislature is trying to raise our sales tax by 1%. Well, I thought they're trying to cut our property taxes. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's fine if you're a property owner. Um, you, you like that, but <laughs> you don't like it very much if you're paying rent because your rent isn't gonna go down. Uh, anyway, back to this. Okay, as I identify data elements, I identify those. Um, okay, there's a, this is a weakness in many databases, including ours. Um, the following SQL query identifies that the invoice total is always equal to, or um, finds any problems. And I think, oh, well, I haven't started my database yet. Let me start it. Mm. 
Let him get started. And I will give you this file. Let's see, where is that? Okay, it's there. I'll send you this file. Um, Where was it? Okay. Okay, this is one where I have tested it. I'll go through this. Well, it would be best if I executed the use first. Execute this. Oh, okay. Well, I won't worry about that right now. Um, back to this guy. I'll talk about this in a minute. This one right here. Um, what I what this leaves me vulnerable to a problem in database if I am have redundancy of data. In other words, I have this this um, line items table that I have the the amounts in, and they're just hard coded in there. And then I have the sum over there in the invoices table, and I am given to uh, uh, if I make a typo or something. Um, it could be off, and I think I have one in there, at least in my data, that's off by a penny. If not, I'll make it uh, right. Uh, next one. Okay, I want to break everything. Remember the second piece of that, uh, of the first normal form says that a, uh, a field has exactly one value. If I'm ever going to use this name, as two different values, a first name and a last name. Uh, and you will on a name, first name, last name. You want to break that out into two fields. That's a really um, <coughs> big one. Address that's divided into its components. I've got a street address, a city, a state, and a zip. We did that pretty well. Uh, Street number, would we, would we break out the street and number? I say, would we? No, I, probably not. But there might be a time when you would. I don't know. <coughs> um, and telephone numbers. Should I break it out by uh, area code and prefix and then the four-digit uh, part of the telephone number? Uh, some places you would if you were doing some kind of a marketing thing. Um, Zip code would certainly be broken out because if I'm doing any mailing, I want to be able to sort by the zip code. Um, so if I'm ever going to want a piece of it, I need to break that out. Okay, identify the tables and assign columns. And I would identify, there's three entities on this piece of paper. So I've got vendors. There's information about vendors. There's information about invoices, and there's invo information, there's line items on there. Now, you might initially view the invoices and the line items as the same one, but as you start to think about it, you're gonna break those out into two different tables. Uh, that's gonna work a whole lot better. Um, and I got some possible tables and columns. And this, again, I'm just working through this. So I'm putting the stuff up there, vendor name, address, city, state, zip, phone number. And um, I don't know why they lined out 
vendor fax number. I just left it the way I got it from the, um, I think this came from the slides. Um, that's what they did. They took it out. They took out vendor AR first name, uh, vendor accounts receivable last name, vendor accounts receivable phone, terms and account number are come from, uh, let's see. I think, what am I saying here? Uh, italics appear in multiple table. I added them if they appear in, in italics. So I had to add an account number for the vendors. I'm not sure that made the final cut. So invoices definitely need an account number. I think that's a default account number for the vendor. So I should have put default account number there. Um, uh, invoices, I have an invoice number, invoice date, and they give me an invoice number. The, the client gives me an invoice number but I need to give it my own invoice ID. So I'm gonna to have to have an invoice ID. I don't have anything here that it can be used as a primary key because invoice number, I don't know that I'm gonna get that, that that will be unique. Um, so I can use their identifier, but I, I have to have something that I know will be unique. So I'm gonna have that invoice ID number, invoice ID. Under invoice line items, I have invoice number, quantity description, unit price, item extension, that's going to go, account number, and sequence number. Now, the sequence number is as I have different line items on one invoice, they're going to get a different sequence number. And we're going to talk about how, how I can do that that's maybe a little bit better. If I go over and look at the data, let's see, um, under view, Let's go take a look at the invoice line items. Look at the data. Notice the invoice ID and the invoice sequence number. Well, look at that invoice ID one and one, two, one, three, one, four, one, seven, one, eight, one, nine, one, ten, one, eleven, one, twelve, one, twelve, two, twelve, three, twelve, four. What's going on here? in those two fields. The invoice sequence number. It's the same in all of them. Mm -hmm. And it's as a invoice ID is the page invoice sequence is increment. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you see this somewhere else on here uh, for invoice ID 12. And then there's a couple, oh yeah, here's another one, 78. I think that's all. Um, I don't like this. Why? They're all the same. I don't like anything that's all the same. I mean, most of them are the same. The other bad part about this, if I look at the uh, table, invoice line items, and I look at the columns, Notice about the, these guys right here, the primary key. Okay, this one and this one. I have a two field primary key. Why don't I like that? What? Why do you have two? I have two field prime, I have a two field primary key. I only have one primary key but the primary key is comprised of two fields. It is comprised of the invoice ID and the invoice sequence number. 
I would like to, uh, sometimes I'm stuck. Sometimes I can't get around that. If, um, if you come to the advanced database class, we usually build a game of some kind. And I have two player IDs in the table that is for the games. And they're two player IDs and they have to be unique. And that's all I can really do is have a two field primary key. I guess I could just give it a, an arbitrary number, but they are, they're going to be added and then deleted as games come and go. Uh, so sometimes I just have to have a two field, two factor primary key. What about this one? Could I get around it? Do I have to have a two factor primary key? Ooh, what about this? What about if I just started at the beginning, right at the beginning, right up here at one, and I gave the first one invoice sequence one, and then two, and then three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Invoice sequence eleven. Twelve would be invoice sequence twelve. Next one would be thirteen. Next one would be fourteen. Next one would be fifteen, and then. 13 would have invoice sequence 16, and then it would keep numbering 17, 18, 19. And you know, it would be numbered in the order that they were put in. They wouldn't necessarily have any, but I wouldn't care. Why wouldn't I care? I think about it, because this is, this is where the human being has to come in and think about what you're designing. This isn't really programming. This is more like creative writing. Okay. Uh, suppose they were numbered. Suppose that my invoice sequence had no relationship to the invoice ID, except it's a foreign. Uh, uh, except the invoice ID is a foreign key. The primary key is the invoice sequence number. And so, could I find, given that these were, could I find all of the invoice sequences, numbers, where invoice ID equals 12? Sure. Um, given that I want to find um, <clears throat> the invoice ID, all invoice IDs that have account number 533, could I do that? Sure. Get the invoice sequence numbers. The invoice sequence would be one and two and three and 526 and 7,452. And I really don't care. They don't have to be in order. So given that I have an invoice ID, I'd say get all of the invoice line items that go with this invoice ID. That's easy. SQL does that for me. I'm, I have an invoice sequence. What invoice does this belong to? Just go over there and get it. Go and then I can get the invoice number and, and the vendor ID and all that kind of stuff from the other tables. So I don't need this two factor primary key. Um, I'd get rid of that in a hurry. Go ahead. It could be, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. I take the invoice ID out of the primary key and it's just a foreign key. Right now it's half of the primary key and it's a foreign key. I don't know why, but I, I'm, I always feel compelled to make anything with ID in it. Mm -hmm. primary um, or it's uh, with, with me, it's either a primary key or a foreign key. An invoice ID is the primary key of the invoices table. So when you see ID in it, it's, it's some kind of a key. It's a foreign key or a primary key. In this table, in this table the um, invoice ID should be a foreign key. This business of two primary keys. Now, um, anytime I can get around that, I'm going to. Now, you can have more than one, more than one field in a primary key. If you have more than one field, then 
neither field may be null and taken together, it has to be a unique pair. If I made the invoice sequence unique, it solves that problem. I don't have to have that second piece of it in there. I don't know why they did that. Maybe just to give us something to, to argue about and say, you know, this, this guy's really dumb. What was he smoking when he defined that? Um, okay. Back to... Um, the sequence number would become the primary key. Invoice number would be a foreign key into the invoices table. Um, and then I'm going to have to bring the, I'm going to need a vendor ID. Here. Um, basically, after we have identified what goes with what table, this is kind of a process you go through. And you generally, this is why you save your SQL. You'd be running your SQL a lot, getting it running, getting everything set up like you want it to be set up. You spend a lot of time on the design of it. Uh, after we have identified the entities, the tables, those things I'm keeping track of, which data items go where? Um, our authors chose to delete the accounts receivable office information. You may or may not agree with that. Okay. If you do, it's if you don't don't do that, then it's not wrong. Um, one mistake: invoice total should not be included as a field in the invoices table. It is derived from the sum. But we've talked about that. Um, you you may remember that one of our outer join queries, uh, outer join, uh, searched for any row of the invoices that had no corresponding rows in the line items table, and number forty six was the one that was the childless parent in the invoices table. Everybody else had invoice line items rows, but not forty six. Ah. Did you notice that invoice ID had an invoice total of $224? How did it, where'd that come from? Well, I put it in there. Uh, it's, it's clearly a serious problem. We have inconsistent money in, our, in the database. I put that in there just for that reason. Um, let's see. We never found it on Interjoin. Had to run an outer join to get it. Um, go to the next one. Identify the keys. Okay. Um, here's where I have to put in some keys. And when I have to have a key, I will make one up. I do not, uh, did, did we talk about an identity? I believe we did. What is an identity? If you make a field an identity, it is an integer that counts. In Access, what do they call it when it's a field that counts for you? It's got a name in Access. It's called an auto number. Okay, I don't like auto numbers. I don't like them because they restrict me. Um, and I like to have control over it. There is a better tool in a real database like SQL Server and Oracle, it is called the sequence. And that's one thing that I'm gonna talk about when I get to the, at some point before we leave here, talk about creating a sequence, or maybe, it, maybe it's the first thing of the next class, I don't know, but I can talk about it here. A sequence is like a take a number roll at the butcher counter. If you go to Kroger, and you a big Kroger, and you go up to the butcher counter, and what do they have? They have a roll there and you take off, take a number. Maybe you press a button and it gives it to you electronically. You take a number. Is it possible for two people to get the same number? It shouldn't be. If you and I both reach for the number at the same time, one of us is going to get in first. They'll get the first number. Next, I'll get the next one. 
then they call you assumably in order, but I don't know, it doesn't have to be in order. The numbers don't have to be in order. They can, you can mix them and match them, but most of the time they're in order. And when you're inserting into the database, you just reach up there, take a number and put that number into the database as the primary key. Gives you a very good way um, to get a number. I think SQL Server will even do dates. They'll give you dates. A date stamp is a pretty good way. If you're not going to try to, two people can't try to put in the, the value at the, exactly the same millisecond, which they probably won't. And even if they did, somebody would just get an error and they'd try it again. Um, okay. So I go get a primary key. So vendor ID is just a number. It's an auto number probably. And that uh, links to, to the foreign key. And this is commonly done, this, um, this uh, crow's foot on one end of it. That's very commonly, uh, that, that gives us a one to many relationship. One invoice ID to many. Now notice this invoice ID and invoice sequence here. For me, it would be invoice ID, primary key from the invoices table, invoice line items, invoice ID would be the foreign key, invoice sequence alone would be the primary key if I were doing this. Fair enough. Um, okay, here I talk about, you know, one, 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 two, Two, one, three, one, three, two, three, 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 four. Um, I just don't like it. Okay, the way I would do it, I would just start off numbering one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the line items as they came in. I don't care if they're in order with the invoice IDs. The invoice line item sequence doesn't have anything to do with the invoice ID except that it's a foreign key. It's the primary key. And so invoice sequence ID one goes with invoice ID three, as does sequence three, sequence six, and sequence seven. SQL will find those in a millisecond. Doesn't, it's, it, that, that's what it does really well. Um, they're no longer, uh, well, the pairs are no longer the same. Um, everything's fine. So I can retrieve the information very easily from this. I can even order by the invoice sequence. It'll be fine. It'll order just fine. So when it puts it out, it'll order it for me and everything. Um, it's just the invoice sequence three doesn't have any relationship to the invoice number three. Wana, you're shaking your head. Is that, do you think it's a good idea or bad? I, well, I do have some repeated information in there, but uh, um, less so. Okay, so I can get all the three stuff very quickly. And notice that it's in order by, it's just not a problem. Uh, for simplicity's sake, uh, I'm not going to talk about the general ledger accounts, GL accounts, but I don't believe I have talked about this. Sometimes we have talked about the one-to-many relationship. When I have a one-to-many relationship, what happens? The primary key of the one side gets copied over into the many side. The primary key, the parent side, the one side of the relationship, gets copied over into the many side of the relationship. One-to-many. He must keep the same type. So if he's an int over in the parent, he has to be an int in the child. In my opinion, he should keep the same name if you can. Can't always. Um, now, some things have a many-to-many -many relationship. For example, employees and committees. One employee may serve on many committees. One committee may have as a member many different employees. So I have a many-to-many -many relationship. 
When I identify a many-to-many -many relationship, I get this. A table comes into existence between them. Has to. Uh, the book calls it a linking table. I call it a bridge table. You can call it anything you like. Now, call it one of those. Notice that that bridge table, that linking table, has in it the primary key of the one side of the table and the primary key of the other side of the relationship are paired here. Therefore, if I had a, let's see, do I have anything in, I don't have um, uh, examples. If employee ID five serves on committee three, then in this, uh, in this memberships table, I would have a five three. Employee ID five can also be on committee 27 and also on committee 146. So I would have three rows in there that had employee ID five in them. Committee three could also be served by employee six, employee 22, and employee 56. I would just have more rows in that table. So um, the question then becomes, what is the primary key of memberships? The bridge table. Uh, in this case, uh, as I have it drawn here, it would have to be both. There is a number, another way to do it. Uh, lots of times you'll see this uh, done with um, oh, prescriptions. Uh, one patient gets, is prescribed many medications. One medication can be prescribed to many different patients. Uh, and in that case, um, you can do it this way and have both of these as the primary key. What you can do is you can just give it a, a, a stamp it with a number, give it a primary key, and call it prescription number. Uh, because there's a lot more information than just a name and a drug in a prescription. There's quite a bit of, uh, <laughs> when, uh, when they write a prescription and it hits the pharmacy, it just generates a blizzard of data. <laughs> um, but that's how it's done. So a uh, many to many relationship. Notice it comes out of one table on a one to many going that way. <clears throat> comes out of this table many to one. So the many to many is done in this third table. Sometimes this table will have other information in it. Um, um, for example, if this were patients and medications, if I had something in here, if I had a comment written into here, this would be the patient is allergic to sulfa. Do not give this patient sulfa, for example. Um, over here would be the, the medication. This is it would be aspirin or um, uh, Tylenol or uh, uh, tetracycline, something like that. And over here it would say, let's see, tetracycline. Uh, you're not supposed to take dairy with that, right? I think. Say, do not take dairy with this medication. Do not drive with this medication. Okay. So everybody that gets this medication gets that do not drive, do not take dairy products. Um, employee. Um, so this, this applies to all employees. If it's over here, employee, it applies to all medications. Don't take the, don't give this patient sulfa anywhere over here. So that's where you put the, pa the, the patients. Here, my uh, line in that would apply to the prescription. So that would be take this, take one pill three times a day with food or something like that. So it's dosage, and I don't know how you take one pill three times a day, but uh, whatever, that would be where that would go. Um, there are times when we will have two tables and a one-to-one -one relationship between them. Um, now, a one-to-one -one relationship why would I create a one-to-one -one relationship when I can do that in one table? I don't need two tables. Okay, here's the reason. Um, 
many times, there are times when we have a field that is called sparse. A sparse field is a field that ha that is it's a pretty good sized field, and it has a lot of null values, many null values, over oh twenty percent null values, is is what I use to is is my cutoff. If I have twenty percent, I'm gonna think about this, and particularly a problem if the field is fairly large. Okay, consider this. Some of them have a photo in the database. However, most do not. This is, I, I made that up. The photos are fairly big. And most of my employees don't have them. Only the upper management has them. But everybody has a field for it. Okay. A photograph takes up a fair amount of space. And it's a big winner for us to put it into a second table. Now, notice that I have employee ID as the primary key of both tables. And it is a foreign key. Um, let's see, which one is the parent? Okay, the parent would be the employee ID. Foreign key would be down in the photo. Okay, so this, this is a foreign key. References this one. They have to be unique. Both of them are unique. Therefore, an employee can only have one photo. <laughs> but the employee doesn't have to have a photo. If the employee doesn't have a photo, I don't waste space storing a null in a three gigabyte um, <coughs> Let's see. Questions, anybody in the audience? I guess you guys hear me. No, you double check. Hello? Double check, checking audio? Yep. Okay. Hear you. Got audio here. You guys hearing me? Uh, yes, Mr. Peterson. Okay, so everything's fine. Yes, uh, my and everything. Okay. Um, anyway, the one-to-one -one relationship is typically done when you have a uh, when you're in that situation. I don't think we have any examples of that, but if I'm in a situation where I have a um, um, lots of nulls in a field. Mostly nulls, we call that a sparse field. I'm gonna break that out and put it into a, a second table that is linked by primary keys. Therefore, I can only, uh, if, I, if employee ID one, employee ID number 27 might not have a photo, but if they do have a photo, they can only have one. Question. Um, no, I won't. I just won't have a record for that employee. This employee will just be a childless parent. And if they have a child, they can only have one. And that's why that um, the only cost to me is when they have a photo, I have to have an employee ID with them. So I have a little bit of redundancy there, but it, it, it takes care of itself pretty well. Okay, data normalization. To apply the first normal form. What does the first normal form say? Three, three rules to it. A field has exactly one value. Okay, you will never store first name and last name in the same field because you'll probably want them. If you're probably gonna want them, split them out now. Uh, data are accessed by content only. I'm never going to go in and go and ask for the third row or anything like that. Notice that the top 10 or something like that violates that one. Um, let's see, content only. And finally, um, no duplicate rows. So the, the primary key, they have a primary key. Uh, 
first vendor name, I have two words present. Is that, is that two fields? I don't think so. Will I ever want to break that out? On the other hand, over here in the item description, um, that is multiple fields. Um, I haven't gotten the primary key yet. First thing I'm just getting, I'm getting rid of the uh, multiple values fields, multi-valued fields. So basically I'm going to break out VB, SQL, library directory, and into uh, fields of their own. Um, and the vendor name, Karner's Publishing, I'm just going to leave it alone. So here is the invoice data with it broken out. Now notice that now I have repeating columns. So I have uh, item description one, item description two, item description three. And so I have all of this. I'm getting nulls in there. The question is how many item descriptions can I have? What do you think? Is there an upper bound? Not really, there isn't. I don't know. I have to have that many fields, whatever it is. I arbitrarily, I say, well, I'm just going to put it at 50. That means that every record in here has to have 50 fields, even though I'm only using one of them. I'm just wasting 49 fields. Um, so that's the main thing. The other thing is that... Um, Many textbooks call that first normal form. I don't. No repeating um, values. Invoice number 97553 contains multiple null values. Um, this is a problem. I'm not going to argue whether that's in first normal form or not, but that's not desirable. This is better. Invoice data in first normal form now. When I break out the vendor name and just simply item description, now they're starting to pick up vendor line items here. So I still have the vendors and the invoice number. I still have a lot of duplicated values in here, but basically it's starting to get, uh, break out and I've gotten rid of the nulls. Okay. Um, and let's see. Now, I don't have any duplicates, but I might have. Um, I don't have anything to use as a primary key. So if I add in the primary, the keys, I'm, I've got to add in the invoice ID, and I've got a vendor name, invoice number, invoice sequence. So I've got the invoice ID and the invoice sequence. I think I will need one more primary key for the vendors. Where did the vendors go? Okay, this is the way the book did it. Uh, first normal form, invoice ID. Um, Invoice sequence, one, two, three, four. So the invoice sequence is carrying on and the invoice ID is, goes with the invoice number. Invoice number, vendor name, invoice ID. And now I have the primary key going to its foreign key. Um, and I think here I'm going to go in and I have to get the vendor ID in there. So when I go to the second normal form, uh, and the second normal form says that every non-key column must depend on the primary key. So this is where I break out the invoices and the vendors. So the, it has to depend, if it's not the primary key, it has to depend on the primary key. 
Um, so I find that it doesn't because the uh, vendor name doesn't really depend on the invoice ID. So as I break it out, now I get into the situation where I have to have a vendor ID. So that's where I pick him up. So the vendor stuff has now migrated out to the vendors table. The invoices, the invoice and the invoice line items, and basically I'm sticking with these, but I put in the um, GL accounts and the vendors. Notice that the GL accounts has two lines leaving it. They run together there for a while. They run um, many to uh, one to many here and one to many here. Therefore, the GL accounts implements or affects a many to many relationship. There is a many, many to many relationship from invoice line items to um, to the default account number. Right? Default account number isn't a key, but from the from the invoice line items account number, many account numbers can map to many default account numbers here. One default account number here can map to many account numbers in this table. So it does rep it does affect that. Anytime you see leaving the table as, as on the one side, two of them going out, and they go to a many out there, you have a many to many relationship. Not a whole lot of those. Most of what you do will be one to many. The author asserts that these are in third normal form. I say not. The two field primary key and the invoice line items could be improved, um, but it, uh, it doesn't break any of our rules. I don't like it, but it. Uh, it uh, um, that field in the invoice table. Or is it that field called um, um, invoice total? Where is it? Right there. Invoice total is really giving me fits. Um, and that doesn't depend on the invoice ID. It depends on the sum of the stuff that's in the invoice line. That blows our third normal form out of the water. Um, did I get rid of it yet? No, it's still in this one. Uh, third normal form, here's the little saying that we have the key, the whole key, the key. First normal form, think the key. First normal form is where you get the, the primary key, okay? And some other stuff. Uh, everything has to depend on the, on, uh, you get no, no duplicate keys, no multi-valued fields and no such thing as going and give me record number two. Um, the second one, the whole key, that second normal form. And finally, the third normal form, nothing but the key. And then we always put this one in there. So help me, COD. Uh, Boyce COD was an Australian database computer scientist who came up with this uh, who, who defined the, the relational database, and essentially he's considered the father of SQL. Um, okay, if I wanted now to get the um, invoice total, I say select invoice ID from invoice line items and that all that jazz, I think. I think I'm through this. There's the quiz. And okay, I'm going to give you this um, this SQL. Stuff that this is what we're going to, uh, th these are my examples that I'm going to work through. The assignment is not difficult. Um, 
I think the assignment asks you to design a database. Uh, just to give you a little bit of practice doing it. Um, let's see, you may design it using a um, Word if you want to. You can use Word tables, you can, you can design it in Excel, you can put your arrows in there, you can draw them in there, it'll be okay. This one, this is probably the only time in this whole class that you're gonna turn in paper. Okay. Notice we haven't ever passed around a piece of paper. This time you can turn in paper. For those of you who are online and don't want to come in to turn in paper, you may scan it in or you may just do it uh, st starting, you may start off in Word and just use the Word drawing tools. You may use paint um, or anything else, Visio or any of those um, products that you wish and then you may attach it to your assignment if you are on campus you may give it to me in class or send it in with somebody else I mean um, uh, lots of options but you uh, you can scan it in uh, take a good picture of it and you can send that okay and we are at break time yeah but I will, I will give you this, um, this file that I'm gonna use right now. I'm going to pause the recording now. Okay, let me uh, cover a couple of things. I'm going to turn on test two. Uh, where is that? Well, somewhere here. Okay, I'm announcing test two. I will post this as an announcement immediately after class. Um, test two will be opened on April 12th, 2019. That's Friday, that's today. Um, it'll be opened in just a few minutes. I'll start it. Test will remain open until 11.59 p.m. 11.59 p.m. That's one minute to midnight on April 19th, 2019, that is next Friday. We have no class next Friday. At 10 o'clock next Friday, I will log in at the usual time and be available to troubleshoot any problems that we have. Um, I think I have like a, a time, expected time for you to keep the test from the time you open the test till the time you close the test. Um, you don't have to worry a whole lot about that, okay? Um, I mean, if you go real long time, I guess it'd be, but um, if you're a little over, just go ahead and finish your test. Do not go past the cutoff time. Do not miss the due date, the close date. What is the close date? April 19th at one minute until midnight. Um, okay. If you intend to skip the final, it'll be absolutely necessary. Um, the final will be a makeup opportunity. If you are satisfied, then the final will be optional. Um, okay, I'll get this posted and that will um, open. Oh, I'll probably open the, the test by about noon. What's up? One. What? Um, I, I'd, ha I'd have to go look on the calendar. Uh, it is the, we'll have the last day of class and then the final will be the following week at the regular time. So it's, it's not a, a strange time for us. It's, it's on a Friday. It's at 10 o'clock. In class. It will be available online. Did I not uh, post them? I don't know. Uh, let me look. I, uh, they, I don't think I have posted them for, um, I haven't posted the practice test for the online class yet. Okay. Um, uh, be a good idea for me to get to that. Let me go ahead and turn that on now. Turn on the practice test and everything for the online class.
Okay, it is on for the online class. Okay, I'm turning it on now for the online class. Okay, why isn't that showing in green? It's not past 12 o'clock yet. No, oh, okay. Um, let me edit. April 19th at 11.59 p.m. Okay. Okay, so you should now be able to see test two if you are in the online class. And if you're trying to see, you can all open the first page without starting it. And Edit. April 19th at 11.59 until. Okay, uh, why don't you guys check and see if you can um, if you can see that and open the first page. You don't have to start the. Well, you should do the practice first. Uh, it's up. It's up. Okay. Um, I'm expecting you to do the practice first. I, I just wrote them last night. Um, okay, let me go back to this guy. Okay, use APDB. Now, I'm going to basically, I'm gonna test this and I'm gonna select the sum of the invoice line item amount as my invoice total from invoice line items. And basically I'm gonna get a whole bunch of them there. Basically I'm really only, I'm, I, to test it, I'm only gonna show those that have a, a invoice ID that have more than one invoice line item. I should see two of them. Um, so I'm just gonna test it by running that and that should be the same as it is over in the um, um, over there in the uh, uh, invoice total column and since that since I have done that I can take a look at it and I can um, take that off test it again make sure let's see I got 114 rows I should not see number 46 
45, 47. 46 is a childless parent. 46 is an error, by the way. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take this query. This is the same query that I just wrote up here. And I'm gonna use that query as a table in a left outer join. I was trying to see what the difference was. Okay, so I'm gonna say select uh, invoice ID, vendor ID, all that jazz from invoices left outer join and I'm going to select um, where is it my invoice total okay so instead of invoice total I've named it my invoice total I could have named it invoice total and then I would have just had to, had to have said l dot invoice total I could have I just didn't want to name two things the same thing that kind of bugs me unless there's I'm really getting something for it so when I execute this thing notice that it is a left outer join it is pointed at the invoices table what does this mean i'm going to get all of the invoices including childless parents okay so i should see number 46 in this uh, when i execute um i see this it's just like the it's just like the invoices table. My invoice total is there, but notice oh, down here in number forty six, it's just no. Why is it no? It's a childless parent. It is supposed to be no. Now, what would happen if I selected the same thing? What would happen if I were to go look at the invoice actual invoices table? I don't have to have a go around it. Select everything from invoices. Now remember 46 is a childless parent. And now when I select everything from invoices, well, it'd be nice if I got the whole line, one of the problems with this. And I go down to 46. Look at number 46. 46 has an invoice total in the invoices table, but no children, nothing supporting that. We have a major problem there if, we, if this were a money database. Mm -hmm. I have an inconsistency. Um, this has to be fixed. Okay, and this is how it's fixed. I, instead of of having that invoice line item amount in their invoice total hard coded in there, I'm deriving it from the um, from where it really lives. So I'm bringing it over in a view. I'm making the view look like the invoices table. Excuse me, I don't have a view yet. Now I'm getting ready to create a view. Okay, a view. So this is the next topic. I'm kind of running a couple of things together. I always have, I always try to have more information than I'm going to get through, um, but I, I don't typically run over. Um, a view. A view is simply an SQL select statement. It is an SQL select statement that is saved, compiled, and saved in the database. Okay. Now other other databases let you execute files from the command line. SQL Server does not. SQL Server, you have to save it as a view or you have to load it into your, your um, command window, load the whole thing. You don't have a way to say, okay, go out there, find that file and execute the code that's in that file. Oh, that would be nice. I really miss that. Um, but why you act like, uh, uh, why do I miss that? I miss that particularly when I'm creating tables. Um, and many times I, if I have 15 or 20 tables to create, I will break them up into pieces 
And then I say, and then when I get everything running, I want to say, okay, do it, create them all. Well, if they're broken into five different files, I have to go run five separate files. Okay, maybe it's not the end of the world, but it sure would be nice to say, okay, execute these guys just one after the other like a machine gun. Um, but I can't. So a view. A view is an SQL statement that is saved and given a name. It does not create any new data. It does not create a table. It just puts the code in there and saves the code. And when you and you treat it as a table, because remember, I told you that if anybody ever listens to me, I told you that the output of a of an SQL statement was a table. So it is a table. And many times you can actually update and delete from that table. Not all the time. Okay. Um, if it's only based on one table, you definitely can. Views are commonly used to hide confidential information. For example, I set up a database once for a company. And the company had a human resources uh, department and various other departments. Now, the human resources department gets to see anybody's personnel jacket, personnel folder, except human resources. They've got their own. They've got their own personnel database, or they've got. They're in the database. They've got their own records, but they can't look at their records because they're from HR. And you can't. I. You know, if you and I are working together, I can't look at your personnel file. Somebody else has. That's typically accounting, and I supervise accounting. Accounting supervises me. Kind of thing. Um, set it up as a view. View one is for. HR. HR gets to see, select all records from the database where the department is not equal to accounting. Excuse me, HR. Accounting gets their own view, select all records from the database where the department is equal to HR. I don't have to duplicate the database. All I do is uh, create a view. This is just a, a great way to do it. Um, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take this. <clears throat> Assumably, I'm going to be using this. Take this join. No, I'm not going to take this join yet. I'm going to take um, this piece of the join right here. I'm gonna do like one I did on hers. So I'm taking just this piece of the join. And right, I could, this would run by the way, if I said to run this, it would execute just fine. So there's the invoice ID and the totals. And then I have to give it a name in here. So I'm gonna create the view. I'm gonna name it my invoice totals view. When I create a view, I usually append underscore view to it to show it. When I look at it, I can see what it is. Okay. I, invoice totals would be fine. Invoice totals view would be fine. I cannot name it invoices unless I change the name of invoices, and I don't like changing names. And basically, it just it just runs. Invoice ID, sum, um, group by invoice ID. I give every, um, I have to give every field a name. I cannot have any uh, anonymous fields in, in a view. And typically views are not ordered. A um, couple of options that I have on a view that I wanted to talk briefly about. Um, well, I'll come, I'm going to come back in a second. So now I say select the invoice ID, blah, 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 left outer join, left outer join what? The view. Just like, just like I just, I just took out that, um, that code, pasted the view in there. And now this will run just fine. When I execute the, um, well, it would be nice if I 
executed it. Uh, to when you create a view, you must have a go before and a go after. That is typically the case when you create anything. Go before a create, go after the statement. And that is typically true. Uh, it doesn't make you do it on a table. You should do it on a table anyway. It works sometimes if it doesn't work other times. Um, so now this should run. And notice it does. If I scroll down to 46, I still see 46 and 46 is displaying null as it should. Now, the, those, the data are still over there in the invoices table. I'm just not using that field anymore. It's not, it, it's not a part of my life. I'm just going to leave it in there. I'll go in and take all the data out of it, and, and then I'll mark it to be deleted. It's not important to me to delete it right now because I don't like deleting records. Why are de deleting fields? Why don't I like deleting fields? What? I will cause fragmentation. Yeah. And if I, when I, uh, fragmentation means I have holes in my data. So I'm going to make a hole. There, it's not hurting anything to leave it there. And I'll delete it when uh, the next time my, uh, my system goes down for scheduled maintenance. You have to build that into every database. Uh, so when I have to take it down uh, on a Sunday morning between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., that's when I'm going to go in and delete it and then defrag it because I can throw everybody off of it because I told them I would. They get anything running? That's just tough. Um, so I just leave it there. Um, I don't like, and oh, I would use a view if I have to add a field to a table. I would add it using a view. I would put it in another table, join them, and give you a view. And it would look to you just like that table had another field in it. Um, it wouldn't be as fast, but hey. Uh, gee, that was fun. Let's go. Uh, here I'm going to create the whole thing. Create the view, my invoices view as, and now notice that this one um, does the left outer join with the other view. So basically, I'm putting them all into something called my invoices view. And now I can just select from my invoices view. Hey, let's see if we have any problems. Um, Notice that this is an inner join. I need to change this to a left outer join. Now, one of them is going to be null. I don't know whether I'm going to get that in the inequality or not. Let's see. Notice that I did not get the inequality, OK? Um, because not equal, if one of them's null and one of them isn't null, they aren't equal and they aren't not equal either. So I'm going to have to do a little more searching on that. Let me go back over here and to um, Object Explorer. What's that? Um, Invoice line items, invoice line item total. Let's change this first one, number one. Let's change it by a penny. Only off by a penny, not really a big deal. Okay, and now I'm gonna go back and run that again, wherever it was. Let's get him again. And notice on invoice ID one, the old was 33. Uh, I've lost a penny someplace. Nobody's going home until I figure out where that penny went. Well, you saw I just took it out of the database. But um, 
and I should have been logging that and everything. So I could have been could have gone in and figured out what happened to that penny. Um, finding that um, that one that uh, uh, record number forty six is a little bit more problematic because I have one that is null and one that is not, and I set that one up to be difficult to find. So it's that null and not null because you're not going to find it where they're equal and you're not going to find it where the two values aren't equal either. It just doesn't find them. Nulls are a, pr a problem. Okay. And I'm going to get through this. Insert into my invoices view. Inserting into a view. Now, if a view is based on one table, only one table, and the fields that are returned in the view include all of the required columns, or those required columns are defaulted. Right? In the, when you create it, if you gave it a default value, then you don't have to have it in the view. Or I have to have all of the required columns, meaning I have to have the primary key and anything that I put in there. So all of these values, all of these guys are required. Most of them are. So I have to give it values. I'm giving it 115. I know that's the next one. And various, I just give it today's date. Um, and if I insert into the view, what happens? Bingo. And let's see. If I take a look at it, this is down at the very bottom, 115 has been inserted. Cool. So I inserted it into the um, the view, and it went through, and it inserted it into the the table underneath it. But I have a problem. Ooh. No. Why not? Let me uh, rephrase your you don't want to you don't want to change the table using the view. Most of the time that is exactly what you want to do when you insert into the view. Um, I will typically use a view uh, for example, let's see what is this invoices when an invoice gets real old. I want it to go away. I don't want to see them forever. So I would probably use the view to only show me the current invoices. Um, in a doctor's office, I would have a field in the record, in a patient's record. Um, it would be a tiny int and it would be zero is false and one is true. And when a patient is no longer the doctor's patient, I cannot delete their records. So I simply go in and I change that field from a one to a zero. And now using the view, because the view is based on that, I call it active, and where active is equal to one, if I change that one to a zero, <clears throat> I just don't see them. Okay. SQL Server does not have a true false, also known as Boolean. Boolean. We, uh, we, don't, we don't have one of those in SQL Server. Uh, Oracle does and um, Access does, but SQL Server does not. That's okay. I don't miss it. Uh, the smallest thing you can actually access anyway is a byte, so you may as well use a tiny int. Um, let's see. Here's the problem. When I try to say delete, now I know I have that record in there. So when I try to delete, I get the red line. It says you cannot, viewer function is not updatable. Updatable, 
because that modification would affect multiple tables. In other words, if I updated him and deleted him, I could leave parentless children. Um, right. So I've got a problem. Um, now I can fix this. I can fix this, but this is not real easy. And I'm reaching ahead, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to end the lecture for this class now, and I'm going to reach ahead just a little bit. Now, you don't have to follow along if, if you, um, I'm not gonna ask any questions about this. But in order to fix this, I have to step outside of my bounds a little bit by just uh, the very first um, couple of lectures in the next class where it's programming. And I have to appeal to something called a trigger. And it's in about the next chapter after the end of this class. And a trigger is a piece of code. Now there are three operations in SQL that change data. Well, in, yes, insert. Insert is one of them. Update is one of them. Delete is one of them. Those operations can be what we call triggered. I attach a piece of code to <clears throat> uh, that record. Um, and you think of it as a method in Java, sort of. When something happens to that record, this code executes, okay? Um, they get pretty tricky to write, difficult to write. We're gonna write lots of triggers in the next class. I'm gonna show you your first one, okay? The name of the trigger, like uh, constraints, I tend to make them long. My names are long because I don't use the, I don't call it very often. But when I delete, it's going, this trigger is gonna take over, and instead of just deleting from the table, this trigger is going, we say it fires, you know, bang. Uh, so we say the trigger fires, the trigger executes. A trigger can execute, I can own the trigger, or the supervisor, the admin can own the trigger. So the admin can trigger something about that table too. And if the admin wants to supervise the tables, the admin can audit anything using triggers very powerful okay it's creating something so i have to have a go create trigger a long name has to be unique on the view instead of delete so when you say delete on this view, I don't want you to delete, I want you to execute this code instead. Okay, what does he do? Well, he begins, we have begin end. This is, now this is sequential code. It will have SQL written into it. But basically now we are in a program that is executing one, two, three, four. Of course, we're in a program that's doing that in our um, query window. Okay, declare, I'm gonna declare a integer. My, in, my integer is named INVID. It begins with the at sign, as all local variables do. Okay in this language not not all in that's not the same in in all programming platforms this one's this is a little bit different this is called t sql t sql there are others their plsql is uses a different syntax okay go grab something from the database what do i grab set in other words i select the invoice id I'll get the invoice ID, put it into that variable, from deleted. Now this is unique to a trigger. Deleted says that record that I'm just about to clobber. Go out there and get the invoice ID 
out of the record that I have selected to delete. Don't delete it yet. I, I just need the invoice ID. Now I have a problem here. If I try to delete where it's less than three or something like that, I'm gonna have a problem, but I'll worry about that later. Right now I'm just trying to delete that 115. Okay. If, and my if, if exists, in other words, if I get anything back, when I say select invoice ID from invoice line items, where the invoice ID is equal to that thing that I just got out of the, the record, what's happened? I've got children. Hate children. Okay. Now, what can I do? Well, I could go over there and delete them, but that is considered to be a very bad thing to do. That's known as the resume generator. Don't ever, don't ever let it cascade. Okay, what am I going to do? Nothing. And I throw, uh, no. so I would have a, there, there's a line of code I can put that says, throw an error, raise an error, error, it's with all that red lines up there and, and really call him names. Well, don't call him names. Okay, um, throw an error. Else, delete from invoices. And this is your first trigger. Well, I say create trigger. I've got a trigger. Now that I have that, execute. Notice I will get two of those. <clears throat> um, Reason I did it is because there were two uh, select statements. <clears throat> there was a select statement where I got the uh, got the value from deleted, and then when I went and clobbered the one in <clears throat> in invoices. If I were to look at this now, if I were to look at the either the invoices or the view invoices view would be fine. I uh, go down here and scroll down to 115. 115 is gone. Okay. It has a little problem. Uh, I cannot use that, that trigger easily to delete more than one record at, 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 a, at a shot. So I have to, I'm gonna, uh, I either have to disable that or I get, I get into a whole bucket of worms. I can disable it. I can say, if you're going to hit more than one record, just abort and say, you got to do it one at a time. Um, questions. There may be some questions about the trigger. I don't want to get into the trigger right now. Um, I'm gonna, I'll give you this uh, code. And for those of you, if I've piqued your interest on the triggers, then we're going to do a bunch of them next time, next semester. If not, then don't worry about them. Um, don't, uh, don't angst out over it. Okay. Just basically the view. Uh, I will cover some more stuff about views. I'm not finished with the views yet. Um, the, um, uh, let's see, the database design is module 12, wasn't it? And then the views stuff, me. Database views, so I have skipped over module 13 because it seemed to go well with the, the database design because I use views and database design. I probably should have just put those two together. I skipped over module 13. Um, okay. Get over it. I will finish up views next time. Um, test two will become available here. No, test two is already available. Um, I'll put out the announcement and I will get this um, recording posted. Questions from my online pajaritos.
Anybody still with me? Well, I still got six people out there. So we're not covering thirteen. What? So we're not responsible for thirteen. Uh, on test two? No, test two. Uh, t yeah, test two starts at uh, twelve. I mean, excuse me, stops at twelve. Oh, I mean, I'm in on final. Uh, I'll tell you more about the final as we get closer to it. Okay. Uh, what I like doing is I like having some time to go back and cover things that I've kind of glossed over because I do need to get to the end. But and so sometimes I skip some stuff. One of the things that we're talking about doing is covering uh, altering the database. In other words, turning on and off constraints. Um, that's important and defragment defragmenting it, taking it online and offline and little housekeeping tools like that okay. um, most of those are pretty easy the um, the exercise for um, uh, module 11 mm -hmm. is you can do it on paper well I've already told you that do it on paper and turn it in whatever um, and Okay, enough of that. I'm gonna wrap it up. Anybody, anybody want to talk? Say something, guys. Hello, Paloma. Hello. <laughs> hey. Yeah, I hear you. Okay. <laughs> Um, just everybody's being so quiet today. Usually you talk more. Okay, well, I'm about to go ahead and end the meeting. And by ending the meeting, I will start getting it um, processed to get it posted. I'm ending the meeting. Good. Oh, we do not have class next uh, Friday. Goodbye, bye to all. Thank you, Professor. Bye -bye. Mm-hmm.